So here's Tyson. Thank you, Logan. And uh, again, thanks to all the people that have helped put this on. Alan has done a great job with this, uh, providing this wonderful facility and uh, the state-of-the-art technical uh, support here. So thanks to everybody again. I'm the one Tyson. with the laser that was in Oh, okay. That, no wonder I couldn't find my laser. All right. It's all yours. Very good. Well, thank you, Howard. I appreciate the opportunity. Before we get started, I want to recruit all of you. Howard gave a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning already, but we have been talking about this subject for almost 10 years. I bought the first air spade that I encountered over 10 years ago and have been uncovering literally thousands and thousands of trees. And it is discouraging that today you go out of here from this meeting and you look around, the vast majority of trees are planted improperly. And you say, well, why is that? There was a study done not too many years ago, and varying studies, on the life expectancy of an urban planted tree. Does anybody have any idea what the life expectancy, average life expectancy of an urban tree is? Anybody have any ideas? 10 years? That's a good guess. What's the life potential of a tree? Generations. Howard and I have been fortunate. We've been working on that pecan tree out in Weatherford. I'm heard, sure you've heard him talk about that it's somewhere around 800 years. 800 years, 10 years. The study that I most recently heard said it was 7.4 years life expectancy. And you go, well, that's nuts. Well, it's because of practices and the people growing trees, what do you think their reaction to 7.4 years life expectancy? All right, we sell more trees. <laughs> it's only when there is pressure from the consumer that this will change. And so I hope that you become a better consumer of trees after my short talk today and that you encourage other people to become better consumers. It's incredible, the cities plant hundreds if not thousands of trees and one of the reasons, what are the reasons that we plant trees? To mark the birth of a child, to uh, in memory of a guy that we played golf with on the golf course, to mark an anniversary when we moved into our first home, all very noble reasons that we plant trees. And trees have the potential to last for generations if we don't mess them up or we plant them improperly or whatever. And so, you know, planting a tree is a belief in the future. It's the most positive thing that we can do. It's the most valuable component of our landscape. We can mess up the grass. We can uh, mess up the garden this year. But trees have the potential to be our legacy. We're our, our grandchildren. I go back to look at trees that my dad planted with my grandfather, and that's really cool. And then I go back to that average life expectancy, 7.4 years. What a shame. I've got some uh, trees here that we're going to go through real quick. They told me they'd shoot me if I go over uh, my allotment of time, so we're going to try to move real fast. I've got Hector Macedo with us, and he's going to help kind of demonstrate some of the things that we find in trees that we deal with. And a lot of this is, it's not rocket scientists. It's uh, stuff. It's real basic stuff that we talk about. When we go out and buy a tree, most of the trees that are planted today are grown in containers like this. We have the tendency to buy a tree based on the top of the tree. What's up here? How many of you focus on that? I do. When I go look at trees, I want a tree that has a certain shape, a certain characteristic. I, I base my buying decisions based on the top of the tree. But the reality is that's not what influences that tree in the future. It's what's in the container that, uh, that makes the difference. You can see up here, can we get a zoom in of the top of this tree with this other camera? We're gonna, Hector, 
turn that tree. Yeah, there we go. See, that's what most trees look like when you go to the nursery. And most people go in and plant that right there. They might deal with the outside edge of the container or something like that. But that's what the tree looks like. And the reason it's like that is that that tree started out as a little bitty plug. It may have been in three or four containers before it got to this point. So inevitably, every time it got put into a larger container, it got deeper in the container. So literally, you cannot go buy a tree like this that is not too deep. There might be one or two or five percent of the trees that are at the right level, but it is a very small percentage. You saw that picture that Howard showed of that root flare? That's what you want that to look like. And we've got another tree back here, and you'll see that's never going to happen unless you do something to it. I tell people that I want the base of your trees to look like a wine glass. What's a wine glass look like? A real dramatic flare, or a pedestal table, or Howard says you can step on it. It needs to be dramatic. Well, this is not dramatic. It is very, uh, it's covered up. Hector, why don't you go ahead and pull that other tree, pull that one aside, and let's look at the next one. We use a tool called an air spade. I don't know how many of y'all have seen air spades work. That's fine, Hector, right there. Just roll the other tree over there. This other tree, we went ahead and used the air spade, and we uncovered the base of it. And you'll see here in just a second that... Uh, can we get a close-up of this? Okay. You see right here, Hector, get on the other, yeah. Right here, this tree looked just like the other one before we started doing it. Soil and stuff was up to this point. We took all of this material off with the air spade and we revealed. You can start to see that flare, can't you? You see it down below there? These roots that are right around there, as that tree grows, will prevent that flare from ever really developing. It will choke it. And it's interesting, a lay person gets the idea that if I have something that's going around my neck, that's not good for me. A guy that's been in the landscape industry for 20 or 30 years says, oh, it's no big deal. We plant them that way all the time. They plant them that way all the time and that's why the life expectancy is so short. We cover them up with mulch, and it doesn't kill the tree. You can go around the city and see lots of trees covered up with mulch. It might not kill the tree, but it weakens the tree. It makes it susceptible to other secondary problems. The guy that originally introduced me to this was a guy by the name of Sandy Rose. Howard talks about Sandy. I used to think Sandy, all he knew was that that was a problem. He contends that 80 or 90% of the problems that we deal with in trees are related to this. If we remove that restriction, man, we, we, we don't have very many problems with trees. But most of the trees in your garden, in the city, are covered up. We use the air spade. Show them the air spade, Hector. This tool is really very simple. It sends a jet of air. We, we hook it up to a compressor, like you operate a jackhammer on, and it shoots a supersonic speed. It's not pressure, it's the speed. And that air goes into the pores or the air spaces in the soil and it literally kind of blows it apart. It's really kind of magical and you get a very fine uh, uh, granular material come out and it exposes the roots without damaging them. So it makes it very easy to then go in and then we'll use a chisel or hand pruners and start cutting that away to reveal that. Okay. So we want this down here to be the soil level at where we plant that tree, not down in the ground. So let's use a chisel or a, a hand pruner. 
you can just go in there and you literally just start cutting them away. And a lot of times people are hesitant and they're worried, oh, am I going to hurt that tree? And I go back to this old hand around the neck. You know, if you cut off this finger, I lost this finger, but I sure feel a lot better. On a tree, it is very easy to just equate removing that one girdling root to pruning a branch in the tree. Cut it away so that you reveal that flare. Very few people, when they plant trees, do this. Have you ever seen anybody do it, planting a tree? No? The guys that are out there planting the trees, they don't want to do it because it takes a little bit of time. They're a little bit scared. When we first started doing this process with the airspace, we worked on large established trees that were having problems. And we started realizing it related back to this. And we were very skeptical about removing those roots. We thought we were going to hurt the tree. Well, it was doctors. It was actually an orthopedic surgeon, a client of mine that was real good. He said, well, what do we have to lose by cutting these roots off? The tree's declining. And so he kind of gave me a, a, a clear path without any liability. And we started aggressively cutting these roots off. And we, for years, did it on large established trees. The pecan tree out in Weatherford that we've talked about, Howard and I went out and uncovered that, and that tree's 800 years plus or minus old. We uncovered four feet of soil and removed some girdling roots. All of a sudden I realized, well, I might have helped one tree today, but tomorrow they're going to plant a thousand trees in the city of Plano or Allen or wherever, and most of them are going to be too deep and they're going to have girdling roots. Container grown trees have girdling roots. There's no way around that. So you need to correct it when it's young and you can make all the potential difference in the potential of that tree. The tree that has girdling roots, if we took that first container and went and planted it, for several years, you're going, oh, that's great. I don't, you know, it's doing fine. Well, it gets through the warranty period or whatever, but it's down the road when that the problems start. There are two problems that occur when you plant a tree too deep. One is that presence of girdling roots. The layperson gets it, that restriction that chokes, it physically chokes the flow up and down in that tree, and so the tree is weaker. The other thing that is more subtle, and you don't really realize it, is that the root tissue of a plant is waxy. The trunk of the tree, that is not. It, we ref, I refer to it as aerial tissue. It's totally different tissue. The root tissue is made to be in the ground, the aerial tissue is made to be above ground. And there is a zone there that right here, out here and below is all root. Up here is all trunk. In between there, it transitions. We refer to that as a transition zone. So here it might be 75% root, 25% aerial tissue. Here it might be 75% uh, aerial and 25% root tissue. It's not a definitive, this is the difference. It's a transition zone. It changes from root tissue to aerial tissue. And one of the things that's really neat, you know, when God created trees, he, he knew what he was doing. Along a creek bank, you go and you see where roots have been washed away by the soil. Look at the texture of those items that used to be roots, they will become aerial tissue. They have the ability to change from root tissue can become aerial tissue. The other way around, it doesn't happen. You don't have aerial tissue that becomes root tissue. Aerial tissue covered up with soil, mulch, and moisture will deteriorate over a period of time. And the large trees that we uncovered that have been covered for years, you can see a definitive line 
where the tissue has deteriorated and it's obviously a different thing. Some people say, well, well doesn't this occur in nature? Well, yeah, trees get covered up in nature. One of the big differences in nature is that you don't have irrigation systems. It rains and then it dries out and it rains again. But even in nature, if you find the biggest, healthiest tree you can find, look at the base of it. Other trees that are not so healthy, look at them. One of the great places that I like to demonstrate this is if you go to the city, uh, the airport, DFW airport, on the north and south entrances, they're just, you know, they planted tons of trees. Find the biggest, healthiest tree and look at the base of it. Find the runt tree and look at the base of it. You start doing that. I tell people I'm not real smart, but when I see something a hundred times, it starts to make an impression on me. When I see it a thousand times, and you know, we stopped counting how many trees we uncovered several years ago and we were like at 7,200 trees. We're way past that on the numbers. So it's from seeing it and the people in the industry, it's amazing until you, the consumer, starts demanding it, it will never change. And that's, you know, I really appreciate what Howard has done and I think Howard realized a long time ago it was through education that he could change the industry. When Howard knocked on doors early on and said, hey, you ought to start using this bat one or, uh, you know, wiggle worm or what, all those products, people kind of slammed the door on him. When he started being in the newspaper and on the radio, those people that would not hear that when the consumer started saying, where do I buy that product, is where it changed. And so, man, I really respect Howard in that he's educated people, the consumers, and it's forcing the industry to change. My mark as an arborist is to hopefully educate people about trees. Again, the most noble thing that you can do to me is planting a tree. I've been fortunate, had some wonderful clients. A couple of years ago, I had a lady that was 99 years old. She called me and she said, Ty, said, I want to plant a new tree. I thought, wow, that's cool. She says, yeah, I want to leave, uh, you know, it for other people. She says, I love Japanese maples. So we went out at 99 and a half and planted new trees. You know, what a belief in the future that it is. So when we plant trees, that's what we want to do. So you see the process there? Now it'd be much easier, and he's taken all kinds of roots off of there, that a lot of people are going to be hesitant to do that. We get real aggressive, but now we can go out and plant this tree, and that tree can become a great, magnificent tree. Okay? Hector, let's go ahead and move and go to the last tree, and we'll show that. But it's interesting, I'm going to talk about three things today, what we're talking about now. We're going to talk a little bit about pruning techniques. And the last thing that we're going to talk about is watering and how it impacts trees. It's interesting that so much of what happens in the growing industry is kind of marketed, market driven. We're talking about Tr growing trees. They want to grow trees as quickly as they can so they don't take their time to get it from this container to the next container because they want to get it to the, uh, to the market as quickly as possible, hold the cost down, and if my tree costs $5 more than somebody else's, I'm not going to sell it. There's another component of it is pruning techniques and how trees come to us from a pruning standpoint. But let's go back and here, you can see this is a tree that we used the air spade on. It didn't take very long. We just blew the soil away and got it to this point. And that's where ha Howard was talking about. You can step on those right there. You know, that's what you want. You want to have this here. Unfortunately, this is kind of funky a little bit because it's attached over there and coming this way. I'd rather, the root system, the ideal root system on a tree is gonna be like a wagon wheel and a radial pattern. 
It's going to come down and out. Soon as we put trees in containers, they start going like this. And sometimes you can correct it, and sometimes you can't. This one already started. It's really, uh, be, we would be too dramatic to cut that off. But we want roots to come out here, 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 all the way around in a radial pattern. So the, go ahead and pull that one out of the container, if you would. There are, for, in a, for a long time, people have known that the side of the ball, uh, right here, you know, let's rough that up. Let's, let's get those roots growing out. The, if, you, if we took one of the other trees out of the container, you'd see just slick slide, sides of the ball. And this is where Howard was talking about, if you'll dunk that tree in water and soften it up, you can literally pull those roots out. The thing that you want those roots to do is to get away. Get away from that container, that space. It's amazing how far the roots on a little tree will go. I've got a small little tree farm that I started a couple of years ago just from a, for experimental purposes and maybe someday I'm gonna start selling some trees out of there. But I've got some small trees that are, you know, an inch, an inch and a half and if you start following the roots, the roots are way out here. It's amazing how far those roots will go. When you get those roots into a large area, how much water does it take? It doesn't take a whole lot because that root system has a larger field to harvest water. When I have a root system that's right there, especially in a container, how much water does it take? It takes a lot of water because it's not very efficient, it doesn't have a very large reservoir to pull water from, and so it requires more and more water uh, to, to help that tree. So you can see right here was, uh, can y'all see, I'll go up here, I'm sorry for confusing you here, but you know, that's where the soil level was. We've taken it down to here. There's a big difference there, a critical difference. And the key thing is that we removed those roots that in the future, if not removed, will become a restriction to that tree. And what happens with those trees, they'll grow along, and then at one point, say you plant three trees, one of them, the one that has the worst girdling root that is the deepest, will start slowing down. It's not going to grow as fast. And your other tree that is at the right depth and doesn't have girdling root, it's going to keep on growing and flourish. So a lot of people are, say, well, it doesn't really harm the tree to have girdling roots and soil up there. Most people are kind of in the dark ages. The real difference is, hey, let's give that tree the potential to be as great as it can be. If we're going to go to the trouble to plant a tree, let's let it be a wonderful tree not one that is stunted. And all over our landscapes, all over our city, there are trees that are stunted. And the people that are in the business, none of them want to address it. The guy that bought the trees for the city, the guy that planted them, the guy that's maintaining them, nobody wants to say, well, I could have done it a little bit differently. So that's uh, where we are on, on that. You can see that that has the potential to grow out far, rough up around the edge, pull those roots out, pull them out, get them out there as far as you can. And sometimes you get down on your hands and knees and you're pulling a root out here and you're digging a trench. Howard for years has said, make a big ugly hole, make it as big as you can and get those roots out there. And talk about not needing to stake a tree. When you plant a tree and the roots are just like this, you need to stake it in a heavy wind or it might go like this. Once you get those roots out here, you don't need to stake it. It's amazing how a little bitty root out away, settled into the soil, how, how rough it is, how tough it is. The tensile strength, the pulling, you know, when you're trying to dig up a plant and you're trying to pull on it, you know, and it doesn't come out and you go, what's holding it? You go down there, it's a little bitty root. When you're pulling, like that on a root, they're really strong. So get them out as far as the way of them as you can. Okay, 
Let's talk about when we plant a tree, we refer to a certain type of pruning. We call it developmental pruning. People, when they go to the nursery, they want a tree that looks like kind of a lollipop, you know, that has a straight trunk and has a, a top on it like this. This is a, you know, a nice looking tree. The best example of this is a Bradford pear. You know, and it's interesting. Howard, are you still in here? Well, Howard helped promote uh, uh, Bradford pears at one time, didn't you? Yeah. You know, well, we all know that Bradford pears are not any good because after, I tell people it's about a 10 or, you know, 15 year tree. Well, it's a 15 year tree because it starts splitting apart. Well, when they're growing a, a tree in the nursery, it comes up and it's coming up and they go, oh, well, that, that won't sell at the nursery or at the garden center. I've got to make it a lollipop. So they prune it in a fashion that all of a sudden you get all this growth and all this structure there. That long term, are you planting the tree for now or for future generations? If you're planting it for future generations, the structure of that tree influences how strong it is and how long it will live. We refer, in our business, we call it El Presidente. The strongest tree has a, a real strong central leader. El Presidente is the strong central leader. When we look at a tree, we try to find, this one has a nice central leader here. Not all trees have that. A lot of them will have, look at this, can you see this up here? Is, is the pointer, can the people see this? Yeah, okay, you can see we got lots of things going on up there. If we will choose and select the guy that we're going to say is the El Presidente, and then we start reducing the other guys, we can help influence how that tree grows. Right there, if you don't do anything, that tree's going to look fine, but in five, ten years, it will have the tendency in a windstorm to split off. You all know the, the strongest crotch in a tree is one that's shaped like a U. The weakest crotch in a tree is the one that's shaped like a V. So if I can start looking, what's that going to be like in the future, and start eliminating those V crotches, I will have a tree that is stronger, much stronger structurally. The strongest tree structurally that's going to have the potential to live the longest is going to be a tree that has a real strong central leader. The next thing is that if I will address the, uh, the, the scaffolding branches, scaffolding branches are the branches that are coming out. Ideally, I don't want two branches coming out right next to each other on a tree. Structurally, that will be a problem. So as I look at a tree and I see places where I have lots of branches there, I might say, which one of those is the strongest one? I'm going to let it develop and I'm going to remove the other one. You don't necessarily do this at the time of planting, but you think about it, and there are trees or branches that you would reduce at the time of planting. What's the time? What, what time am I through at? Five minutes? Five minutes. Five, okay, thanks, Doug. So you start identifying those branches, those structures. The strongest tree is going to have a real strong central leader, and the scaffolding branches, think about it as a, uh, a staircase, a spiral staircase. The scaffolding branches, one would be here, the next one would be up a ways this way, here, and they'd go in a spiral so that as it develops, it has plenty of room. It's when you have V crotches, and when you have two branches right together, when you have five, six, ten branches, you have a Bradford pair, and that's what you get. Okay, so developmental pruning can be some of the most valuable pruning for the long-term structural integrity of the tree. The last point that we want to talk about is watering. Organic techniques helps minimize water. I work most, a lot of my work is in the park cities, 
Unfortunately, the Park Cities has not got the word that there's a shortage of water. They don't have rationing. And most of us think of water as a good thing. Okay, it's water's good, we need it. How about a little bit more water's better? A bunch is great, and flooding the thing is the best thing you can do. It's amazing as an arborist, we see more problems from overwatering than anything. When they started the rationing, I went, hallelujah, I'll have fewer problems with trees. The key thing, people ask me, how often should I water? That's the hardest question that somebody asks me. Because most of the time, they want me to tell them, three times a week, 20 minutes a section, blah, blah, you know, like that. I tell them, you water when the tree needs it. The key thing to me when I tell people is, it's not how much you water, it's how often you water. And the key thing is, make sure that there's a cycle between watering and drying. When you keep the water levels constant, that's not healthy for the tree. The tree needs that drying cycle. So when you water, water your trees really well, and then let it dry out a little bit. Almost magic happens. Overwatering is the enemy of organic techniques. You go and you do all the organic things and you overwater, you've negated what you're doing. The beauty of it is that the organic techniques reduces the need for water. So uh, I'll leave it. We've got one minute, I think, to go. Uh, uncover those root flares, really be dramatic and encourage your city, the neighbors, everybody to do the same thing. Look for structural uh, pruning on small trees. It can really make a difference. And don't overwater your trees. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Tyson. Great stuff. We've been working together for a long time, and uh, you can tell we're kind of on the same wavelength there about trees. We're going to shift gears a little bit uh, now. I want to introduce a friend of mine. Uh, Robert Hutchins. Robert uh, and I have known each other for quite a while. I go down and buy eggs and uh, raw milk, cheese, and uh, meats and everything from a consortium he's uh, involved in down at the Dallas uh, market, the farmer's market down there. They've, he's involved in several of them. He has uh, been generous enough to uh, uh, give us a really nice prize that somebody's going to win today, but R Robert, just a couple of quick things on what you do and why. Well, we uh, are located in Greenville. My family and I raise uh, grass-fed beef and lamb, 100% grass-fed, never fed grain. It's kind of in keeping with our philosophy. We want to keep the animals in their natural environment or habitat, and we'll make sure they eat their natural diet their entire life, never in confinement. Uh, of course, no artificial supplements like hormones or antibiotics, anything like that. We also raise on pasture pigs, chickens, turkeys, uh, hens for eggs, and we're, we are licensed by the state as a grade A raw milk dairy. And I started feeding my family these healthy foods back in the 1980s and uh, started sharing it with neighbors and friends and started selling some and it grew into a business and by 2000, I left my regular paying job, and we've been doing this for going on 14 years now uh, full time. It's very rewarding, and it's uh, very satisfying being able to have this food for my family, but also share it with others. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming. I, if, if you haven't uh, tried uh, grain-fed eggs and grass-fed meats and things like that, uh, assuming you're not a vegetarian, I recommend that uh, you do. Logan, you want to tell everybody about the prize? A couple more prizes. Um, Robert shares with friends and sells at the farmer's market and also is giving us a $75 gift dollar gift certificate for our next prize winner, and that would be Idra Turner from Plano, Texas. I hope I'm saying that right. Idra Turner? All right, we'll go look for her later. Um, and our second prize during this break is the Texas Organic uh, Vegetable Gardening Book. And this goes out to um, someone who actually doesn't live in Texas, which sounds a bit odd. But um, part of my dad's message is, you know, if you use these techniques, they work anywhere. Some of the dates may be a little different, but um, the program works coast to coast, all different kinds of landscapes and soils. So 
The winner is from Colorado Springs, Colorado, and it, that is Max Kinn. So I hope he enjoys this book. Thanks. Thanks, Logan. And uh, Robert will be around, I guess, to answer questions if any of you have any uh, questions about the uh, uh, ranching side of it or growing uh, crops on a larger scale.